Animating character performance on top of dialogue can be quite daunting and intimidating. So I'd like to talk about my overall process and some tips I'd love to share when animating character dialogue. This video is sponsored by Jollibee because why not? Jollibee is a beautiful, sexy bee that serves chicken and some weird ass sweet spaghetti with sausages. Truly a Filipino treasure. Actually, I'm not really sponsored by Jollibee, but if you guys can find one near you, I highly recommend it. Hey guys, this is Sidney Kupantua, and today I'd like to talk about how I approach dialogue and character animation. Now, character animation dialogue can be quite tricky because not only are you dealing with the acting and the performance side of the animation, but you're also dealing with lip syncing. Now, I've been doing dialogue animation for a long time, and I learned a lot doing things like 11 Second Club, doing things for my clients, and approaching different styles of how to animate dialogue. And every time I approach a dialogue scene, it always feels new to me, but I always learn a lot of things from it that I'd love to share. Now, if you're looking for a full on process video or tutorial video, you might as well look into my full course that I sell on Gumroad. But for this particular video, I'm just going to give you guys a full rundown of my overall approach summarized for this video. First of all, you're going to want to think about the style of your animation, whether that's drawing style or the actual movement style. It's going to affect how you think about your poses or how to think about your mouth shape choices. You could do something that's common in a lot of anime where it's just a few mouth poses and they just open and close and, and they don't entirely match up with the audio. And that's because in most anime, the dialogue is done after the animation, which is the opposite compared to Western animation. It's a great choice when you're dealing with limited animation, you're on a budget, the acting and dialogue isn't such a high priority. I think it's a great stylistic choice if you just want to get the point across and you have other priorities that's not just all about lip syncing the mouth to every bit of cranny in the constants and vowels of your mouth. I use this approach in stupid films that I made in under a day or in a few hours. Then there's the overall mouth chart approach, and you find this in TV productions. In TV, character designers come up with different mouth poses and shapes to show what shape it looks like when it's making an ooh sound, an ah sound, or just poses when it's widely opened or sealed shut. And this is because most of these model sheets are sent to a vendor studio, pretty much outside of the main studio where all the designs and, and the pre-production stuff is figured out. Most vendor studios follow a certain format from the A, B, C, D, E, F, G poses. And if you've seen a couple, you're already gonna get an idea of what that format already looks like. The thing about this approach is that the mouth poses just snap into the appropriate sound that it's making, not necessarily forming or morphing into different shapes. When the mouth shape is needed, it's kind of held into that pose for a certain amount of frames or time, and then it just snaps into a different shape. This approach is highly common in Western animation or Western funded productions. This approach is highly common in web animation as well. Then there's the whole classical animation approach, I guess, which is things that you'll find in Disney animation or highly animated productions. The characters are fully animated just as well as the mouths. The mouths themselves are fully animated where you actually see them change shape, they morph into different shapes. There's a lot more articulation and accuracy in the pronunciation of words. The animation can be highly detailed and complicated and it's why it makes this type of animation quite hard and takes quite a lot of time to do. If you're someone that wants to work in animation, whether it's 2D or CG animation, you might want to have some of these in your demo reel. Now, even though these dialogue animation styles are quite different, actually significantly different, one being more economic, for example, and the other one being highly detailed and fully animated, I always have a similar approach for all of them. And the big one being, do the character poses sell what this character is trying to communicate? Are there words, lines, or just sounds in the dialogue sound file that sell ideas? How do I emphasize those ideas? What do I mean by ideas? And for this video, I'll most likely be talking about my approach when it comes to classical animation, but a lot of that stuff can be transferred into other styles of animation. First of all, when you get your sound clip or your dialogue file, keep listening to it over and over again, and also have a written version of the dialogue somewhere. Now, a big rule that I have when I animate characters doing dialogue is that I'm not just animating a character saying their lines or just talking, I'm animating characters expressing ideas and communicating those ideas. And this can be shown in the overall character animation performance. So when I'm looking at the dialogue and listening to the dialogue at the same time, I look at certain key words and this could also be influenced by how the voice actor emphasizes some of those words. Then I would highlight some of those words and see if there's possible emotions that's trying to be exchanged within that word. And those will help me come up with my overall acting and key poses. 
Now, if you're early into animation but want to get serious into character animation, then I highly recommend thumbnailing before you animate. Character animation, performance, and acting can be highly subjective. And there's multiple ways to show how a character expresses anger, disgust, happiness, sadness. The hardest part of character animation and drawing is coming up with a very specific drawing that describes everything, not just the emotion, but how the character is physically feeling, the attitude that character has over other things, what the pose reveals about the character's background, like class and social standing. I'm getting ahead of myself, but when I thumbnail, I come up with many different drawings for the same line of dialogue, or even the same word, just to keep exploring and experimenting if I can find something unique in the acting. Then I would look back at it later and start circling the ones that I actually want to keep. This is something that I always do when I have an idea of what I want, but I don't have the best version of that idea, and this helps me explore that. But over time, as you become more experienced with the craft, it just comes naturally. The thumbnailing process helps you think about your work more. And then because of that, it's become sort of a second nature to me where I don't really thumbnail as much anymore and I just go straight into animation with a very specific acting choice that I have in my head already. Then I would lay down my storytelling poses. Some animators call this their golden poses. Imagine they're like the key keyframes of the animation. It's only there to serve a purpose of the overall idea and the story shift and the shot. This could just be a few poses. I usually find myself only laying out maybe three to four different drawings for this. I'm not worried about syncing everything to the timing or thinking about mouth shapes. I'm thinking about getting the story and the overall idea across first. And another reason why I do this is because I don't want to lose control of the animation, meaning I don't want the animation to feel like it's constantly moving, there's too many poses or too many ideas. I want to just summarize the overall idea in just a few poses, so when I do come back and flesh out the acting a bit more while staying in the range of the storytelling poses, it feels a lot more contained and controlled. And it doesn't matter if the animation is zany or subtle, because even with zany and wild animation, you do kind of have to have an idea of what you're trying to communicate. <coughs> Your sister's in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <coughs> Take her away! <coughs> Your sister's in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <coughs> Take her away! Then I would proceed to make more key poses, and the way I'm thinking about it still is I'm setting up milestones, meaning that I'm not fully animating or animating every specific part of the dialogue or the sound file. I'm still setting up an overall roadmap before I do that stuff. So what I usually do is have a key pose before a sentence and after a sentence, and in some cases before a specific word and after a specific word. But I usually do a sentence or a few words because I want to still keep the performance contained. So when I make more specific keys within the animation, I don't feel like I'll get lost. The same thing goes for if I decide to straight ahead the overall dialogue, I have these key poses knowing when I start and when I wrap up on a certain idea or a certain part of the dialogue. <coughs> Your sister's in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <coughs> Take her away! <coughs> Your sister's in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <laughs> Take her away! Now the next step, I'm not going to animate or add specific mouth shapes yet. I'm mostly just going to add key poses and breakdowns that describe the overall movement of the body and the head of the character. So in some parts of the dialogue, maybe a character says a certain word with more impact. I would try and animate how that character says that word by emphasizing the overall head movement and the body and the gesture when the character says that certain word. I add a placeholder mouth shape, meaning that I know it's not going to be final. I know that when I add more in-betweens, it's most likely going to be changed. Some animators don't draw a mouth. They just leave it blank and they're just going to add the mouth later on. But I personally think it's a good idea to practice implementing mouth shapes along with doing the body movement even though you know there's a good chance that you're going to have to change that mouth shape. <coughs> Your sister's in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <coughs> Take her away! <coughs> Your sister's in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <coughs> Take her away! Next up is the mouth shapes, and before I move on, I want to talk a bit about lip syncing and mouth shapes in general. 
So my animation teachers back then who worked for Disney always told me two rules to keep in mind. One is to have the mouth movements occur two frames before the actual sound. By putting the mouth shape exactly where the sound happens might feel too late. And in reality, our mouths make the shape before sound comes out from it. Before sentence, sometimes I like to have the mouth shapes form maybe four frames or eight frames before the actual sound comes out, just for that little anticipation. Okay, rule number two, and this is quite subjective, is that you're not supposed to animate every single constant or vowel in the speech, or else the mouth movement or the lip sync will just feel too busy. If you were to talk and you just muted the audio, you're gonna notice that the lips are just morphing into broad shapes. Let's take the word chocolate, for example. I'm not going to animate every single letter, but if I just concentrated on what my mouth is doing, there's really only like two to three mouth shapes that I would actually draw. And sometimes it's best to hold some of these poses longer, just so the lip sync feels a little more graceful. Now, the reason why I say it's subjective is due to context. So if I wanted the animation to feel a lot more poppy, a lot more punchy or busy, then I would try and animate every single vowel or constant, but I would only use that sparingly. Like for subtle scenes, I would recommend not doing it. Okay, so back to the animation that I was working on. I have the overall poses for how the body moves, how the head moves. Now I can just, in between these poses, add more frames and breakdowns and within these frames breakdowns and in-betweens this is where i start adding the mouth shapes in relation to the sound file and sometimes i don't get the mouth shape exactly right so after i have all my necessary frames whether that's in-betweens whether that's breakdowns and key poses i would actually go back adjusting the mouth shape frame by frame from beginning to end and in most cases i find myself doing this straight ahead now, like I said, I don't want to have the mouth shapes constantly flap or constantly morph into different shapes. Sometimes I will have a drawing of a mouth pose and then draw the same pose in the next frame, just so that vowel or constant reads. <coughs> you sisters in trouble! <coughs> Someone's coming! <coughs> Take her away! <coughs> you sisters in trouble! <coughs> <gasps> Someone's coming. <laughs> Take her away. <laughs> and that's just rough animation. And some of you guys might be asking, how do I turn this rough animation into cleanup? Or how do I tie down this so that it's more on model? You could simply just create a new layer and do it in the same order as I did the rough animation. So I start with the storytelling poses, then I move towards the key poses and the key poses before a sentence and after a sentence and just keep sculpting it out. And by this stage, it's really just about getting that solid drawing foundation down. You already have the overall animation performance laid out. At this point, it's just prettifying the animation or the drawing and making sure the drawing stays consistent throughout and it matches the model or the design that the project requires. When I do a first pass of animation, I know that it's just getting an idea and the performance across. And the second pass, which is my tie down stage, is just me matching to the style of what the final product might look like. <coughs> you sisters in trouble! <gasps> Someone's coming! <laughs> Take her away! So let's take a look at some of the dialogue animation that I did for this project that I'm working on. When the time comes... Don't hesitate. 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 For all of these shots, the approach has always been the same. I try to find, you know, very minimal storytelling poses, then I work my way with more intricate poses until I make it more on model. Regardless of different context scenes and maybe style, the approach has always been the same. So that was my very general or vague explanation of how I usually approach dialogue animation. There's a lot more I can talk about the subject regarding acting, regarding styles of different dialogue. But I just wanted to share you guys what I keep in mind so when I do approach a dialogue scene, I don't feel completely lost or aimless. Anyways, that's all, bye. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. 
learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos, visit the store through the link in the description below.